بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Can you hear me? Alhamdulillah. All right. Uh, just a recap as usual from uh, Ajib al Jaliya. Um, zakat of gold and silver merchandise. What is a nisab for gold and silver and what is a ruling? Nisab for gold is 20 mithqal or 85 grams, and nisab for silver is 200 or 595 grams. The amount is given um, a quarter of a tenth. A quarter of a tenth is 2.5%. This is a old way of saying 2.5%. It is not wajib because the card for gold and silver permitted to use. Or for example, gold is not uh, allowed for uh, men. So, uh, sorry, it is not wajib to give the card for, for gold and silver permitted to use, which is prepared for personal usage or loaning. The prerequisite for the card to be wajib for merchandise are that it reaches an isab value of gold and silver. Uh, a year pass on it in the possession of that person. It is payable at the end of the year and it is a quarter of a tenth. Again, 2.5%. What is the Zakat al-Fitr? Zakat al-Fitr is Sadaqah. It is wajib at the end of Ramadan upon every Muslim free person or the one that possesses beyond the daily bread for himself and his family and for the day and night of Eid and other than one needs, uh, one's, uh, needs for oneself or that which is required for his Muslim dependence. Um, the best is to give it before the Eid Salat uh, on the day of Eid. It is makru afterwards. It is haram to delay beyond the day of Eid. It can be given a day or two before. It is a sa'a of dates, wheat, raisin, barley, or dried yogurt. If these are not found, then that which is customarily given in the land. It is not permitted to give the, its value. As discussed last week in detail, and the recording is available for that, we went through this, and I went through that table, the chart that I prepared, and the values in Australian dollars, and you can extrapolate from that for your local currency, um, how much uh, those five things are worth. You have to give those five things. And I explained last week that as for the madhab, it's not the money value. You have to give the actual thing, the staple. Um, as that, um, yeah, it's it's not uh, uh, permitted to give its, um, uh, permitted to give its value. So I explained last week, for example, you get somebody, send the money to somebody that you know in those countries. I mean, generally, we have people that we know, and then they buy the thing for you and they keep it there until uh, the time comes and then they um, uh, they give it to the poor people, like a sack of weed or something like that. Um, Asar is 685 dirhams and fifth sevenths of a dirham. And it says here 2.0, uh, 2.040 kilogram. But we went through last week through approximate different um, uh, calculations. Uh, chapter on recipients of zakat. Who should be given uh, zakat? The deserving recipients of zakat are eight. The fuqara or destitute masakin, the poor, those who are appointed to work in collecting zakat by the state, those whose hearts need to be inclined, for example, leaders of a community, whose acceptance of Islam is hope for at least to protect Muslims from their evil, uh, slaves who have an agreement to buy their freedom, debtors, soldiers in the path of Allah, travel, travelers that are cut from the homeland so that he may get back home. Um, Hajj was starting today, I think, and fasting was before this book. Um, just give me one sec, I'll just close the door. I've got um, guest ulama, students actually, ulama who are staying here at my place at the moment. They, um, they're walking around in the background. It's 11 o'clock at night time, so they, uh, they got uh, Khatam al-Bukhari tomorrow. So they're pre making preparations for that, inshallah, in our madrasa. So they're just preparing the lessons and they're walking around in their pajamas. <laughs> anyway, let's, uh, let's continue. Uh, where were we? Uh, fasting. Uh, what makes fasting Ramadan wajib? The siding of the Hilal makes fasting wajib. Hilal siding from the beginning of the month of Ramadan established by the testimony of one upright and legally obligated person who sees the moon. This is to be uh, cautious um, in worship, so not to miss a fast of Ramadan. <coughs> the witness can be a slave or a female. However, this will not suffice for other months except with two upright uh, males. Um, which prerequisites of the fast Ramadan makes it wajib? Four things, Islam, age of puberty, being of sound mind, 
being capable of fasting. What are the prerequisites of a, for a sound um, uh, prerequisite for a sound Ramadan fast? And there's a mistake there. The prerequisite for a sound the soundness of the Ramadan fast are six: Islam, uh, ceasing of menses, uh, ceasing of fast, age of discernment, being of sound mind to make intention the night before. Um, the fast starts up to Suba Sadi for each day is wajib. Remember, we mentioned this last week for each day. It's not just the beginning of the month. It's farad is to refrain, but the slice, slightest thought of that I'm fasting tomorrow it suffices intention. It's farad is to refrain from all nullifiers of the fast from the start of the Fajr until the uh, completion of the sunset. It is permissible for a pregnant or breastfeeding woman, if they, like these are the people that don't have to fast, if they both fear for their own lives to not fast, they merely have to make qada later on. If they both fear for the child, then they can also break the fast and make qada later on. Also, in that case, the guardian of the child, usually the father, must feed a poor person a mud, about half a kilogram of wheat every day. It is uh, permitted for an elderly person to not fast. It is sunnah for a sick person to, or, tra to, or traveler to not fast. An elderly person must feed a poor person for each day missed. The sick person and traveler can make up the fast without feeding the poor. The nullifies of the fast, and this is what we're going to be studying uh, today. Just a quick recap from last week. Um, Okay. Alhamdulillah, wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulullah, starting the Bidayat al-Arabi, we're starting with the invalidators of fast. All righty, um, whoever, de bismillah, um, whoever de uh, deliberately chooses to do the following, while aware they're fasting, will invalidate their fast, meaning break their fast. Eat, drink, or apply eyeliner, uh, which is uh, known to reach the throat, such as kuhul. So surma, kuhul, uh, you put something in the eye. Insert something inside themselves, jof. Inside themselves, meaning the in internal cavity. However it is that a person puts something and then reaches the stomach um, or the inside cavity of the body, detect the flavor of gum being chewed in the throat. Meaning that um, you can have like a gum or like a sap um, that you can chew, but nothing comes off it. But generally when you chew gum, there's a flavoring in there and that dissolves out of the chewing gum initially. Later on, as you're chewing it, that disappears, right? But that that whatever that comes out of it, for example, sugar, there's sugar in it, that sugar or flavoring, that's something in addition to the actual um, gum. So if that is uh, chewed in the, uh, the flavor of gum or the substance of that reaches the throat. Um, swallow phlegm, which reaches the mouth. So, um, Right, so it mentions the throat for the gum, and here again it mentions some of the phlegm swallowing after it has come out. So the mouth is sort of treated like an external organ, and the throat is treated as the inside. So like a dif you can say differentiation between the two. Um, so phlegm is you know phlegm is like um, there's other words for it in English uh, they're not nice to say, but phlegm is phlegm, right? What's in the throat, uh, not just saliva. And you cough it up, and then um, a person swallows it back in. This breaks the fast. Um, induce vomiting. So enforcing vomiting will break the fast. Um, uh, glance, repeated, uh, uh, glance repeatedly or masturbate, which stimulates ejaculation of orgasmic fluid. So imna, that's money, like ejaculation, right? Um, uh, or masturbation, obviously with the hand. Um, these two, which result in uh, ejaculation, right, will um, necessitate, uh, will break the fast. Uh, kissing, touching, to do intimate act that um, causes madhi, 
or uh, he, how does he put it here? Uh, without penetration, ejaculating either orgasmic or arousal fluids. Arousal fluids, uh, uh, John started got some unusual translations which I never heard before, but uh, basically um, precocial fluid um, in other books, how they put it. But madhi is that which comes out when a person is ex uh, sexually excited. So it it's before that. It's not ejaculate, ejaculatory fl fluid. It's that which is uh, comes proceed due to foreplay, etc. So even if that happens, it'll break the fast. If it results because of kissing, touching, or perform cupping, which draws blood, or has it done? Like does it or has it done to them, right? Uh, it is not broken due to the following. Uh, phlebotomy or incision, making a cut in which the bl blood flows out, right? Um, so the, the thing of bleeding, of cupping it is specifically for hijama breaking fast. Um, any other sort of cut or sort of procedure will not break the fast. Thinking until uh, ej ejaculation will not break the fast. It can be some people have this uh, problem just thinking. They're not doing anything. They haven't done any of the things in the previous one. If you look at it, there's actually even glancing. It's not just thinking, it's glancing. All of those sort of things where there's an another action involved. This is just thinking in the mind, results in ejaculation, will not break the fast. Any of the nullifiers of fasting being committed forgetfully under duress, right? So the previous, read all those nullifiers, if they've been made, a person is forced to do them, right? Um, they, uh, or they do it forgetfully, uh, will not break the fast. Ingesting water used to clean the mouth and nose, even if it was exaggerated or done more than three times, right? So... Uh, if you're doing wudu and do it three times or you do it more than three times and water does go, but you're doing it, um, even if you're doing it like with exaggeration, doing a lot, um, it will not break the fast. Unintentionally ingesting a fly or dust, uh, fly or dust, uh, soiling saliva that is gathered in the mouth, right? These will not um, uh, break the fast. <clears throat> Whoever copulates uh, vaginally or anally, obviously anally is haram. It's a major sin, right? Uh, so whoever has intercourse, penetration in the vagina or in the anus, and anus is forbidden haram in the day, even with the deceased. Obviously, in nighttime, intercourse is halal during fasting. Even after Maghrib till Fajr, till the start of the fast, when you're not fasting, when you can eat, intercourse is also allowed even with a deceased or a beast. I mean, they covered everything, um, but uh, like obviously all of these things are haram. Uh, there's mentioning for the sake of fasting, while fasting, whether under duress or forgetfully, right? So whether a person does this by force, duress means somebody else forces it, at gunpoint, for example, or forgetfully. A person um, uh, does it forget, must make it up and pay an expiation. Right, the rulings are the same for whatever was voluntarily copulated with, if they participated while the other ignorant or nor forgetful. So, um, yeah. So someone, uh, the act was done to them, who was volunteer, and they did it. They participated in it, um, and they were not ignorant nor were they forgetful. So they also have to do the. Uh, kafara as well. Uh, their fast is broken and uh, they have to pay the, do the kafara, the expiation as well. And the expiation is coming up in a second to explain. Whoever copulates one day and again during another and does not pay the expiation is required to pay a second expiation, just like someone who repeats it in one day uh, after paying. Right? The expiation only for copulation or ejaculation due to uh, is so the expiation only for the copulation or ejaculation due to lesbian activity during the day of Ramadan, right? This is what the, the kafara is for. Is, a man, what is, a, is manumission of a healthy slave? If one is uh, not able, it is fasting two consecutive months, which if not possible, which is a standard generally is two months, right? Because we don't have, there's no slaves today to free. So then you just do the two months fasting, which if not possible is feeding 60 people poor people. If they are not available, it is voided, unlike the expiation for Hajj, Lihar, and, uh, uh, or an oath, right? So if you, if you can't do the 60 people even, then um, it is voided, like you don't have to do it. But when it comes to the kafara for Hajj, Lihar, and oath, then you have to do it regardless.
whoever um, it is sunnah to hasten to break the fast, say what has been narrated when breaking it, and delay the pre-dawn meal. Whoever misses Ramadan is to make it up. So sunnah to make the iftar as early. As soon as the time entered, azan is, especially if you're in Muslim countries or you're at a masjid you're here, over here, you hear the adhan, immediately the fast, uh, the fast is uh, to break the fast, not to delay it. The reason is, the reason why you kept the fast, stayed away from food, was for the obedience of Allah. And the reason why you eat now is stop the fast. You're not doing it for your personal self. You're doing it out of fulfilling the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you sh should immediately uh, fulfill that order. And then um, sim similarly also by delaying the suhoor right up till uh, fajr, you're delaying it uh, to fulfill uh, the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then immediately when the time enters for fajr, you're in lockdown um, and you are, you are for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whoever misses Ramadan is to make it up. If it was far on you, you have to make it up. It is recommended to do so immediately, except when there are only remains the equivalent number of days in Shaban. They must be made up. So, for example, let's say you missed a whole month or 30 days of Ramadan, for whatever reason, you're traveling the whole month the previous year. Now, the new Ramadan is coming up, and one month before that, you're in Shaban, like we're in Shaban now. Or let's say we got 15 days, 16 days. That's how much is left, right? Isn't it? 18 days we've left. You've got 18 Qadha from last year. Now it's compulsory upon you to the last these 18 days that you have to fast to do those qadha. You could have done it throughout the year, but now, like it's um, uh, in Shaban, now it's wajib upon you to do it. Like you shouldn't be making it miss after this Ramadan, right? You should have made it up before. So it's recommended so immediately, except when there are only remains equivalent number of days in Shaban that must be made up, in which case it becomes obligatory. If required to make up Ramadan, it is not valid to begin, begin a voluntary fast. You should not be doing like extra nafal fast when you have a wajib or fard fast upon you, which is the, the previous Ramadan. You have a qada to make up for fard. That takes priority over any nafal. It is impermissible to delay making Ramadan until the next without an excuse. If done so, it is obligatory. So there's a penalty for delaying it beyond, let's say you missed 10 days last year, whatever was the reason, you were traveling or sick. You have these 10 days that are due upon you. Or lady had her period. She missed um, a week of fasting. She has to make that up. Generally, most sisters, they make it up in Shawal, the month that comes after it. But let's say she, um, the whole year, she didn't do it without any reason. So there's, a, and then this Ramadan starts. Now she's got that previous Ramadan, a whole year past, new Ramadan starts. You can't do anything about it in Ramadan. After this Ramadan, you'll have to do the Qada, obviously. But there's a penalty now for you to feed a poor person for every day. Feeding the person the same as the uh, Zakat al-Fitr, Sadaqat al-Fitr. If such a squanderer were to die, food must be given from their wealth. Even before the following Ramadan, it is not to be uh, fasted on their behalf. So those fasted al-Qadha are not made up for by through fasting. Um, but uh, from the inheritance, this is a debt that is outstanding and is taken inheritance. When inheritance is done of people, the first thing the money is taken out for is their needs of their funeral preparation for their grave and um, coffin, uh, coffin, the cloth and shroud, etc. Whatever needs to be done for the burial, um, uh, the uh, uh, the the four things: um, uh, any debts are paid, right? Um, the debts are paid, debts of Allah, like these are debts to uh, Allah, and then debts of the creation, like money that you borrowed. And then thirdly is uh, wasiyah, the one third that you can take out, like you have a cap of one third, you can spend it where you like or give to whoever you like. And then lastly is the inheritance itself. So this comes under that debt the debt that is due that has to be taken second after the uh, thing before it gets to the heirs, like they're right, uh, the people that um, the miras is given to. <clears throat> Nafal fast, voluntary fasts are recommended, the best of which are the following. Every other day, it's called Soma Dawudi. The uh, Dawud alayhi salam used to fast one day, not fast one day, right? Um, three days of every month, the white days, Ayyab al the 13th, 14th, and 15th in the middle of uh, each month. Um, Thursdays and Mondays, right? Thursdays and Mondays is a sunnah. Six days of Shawwal, best to be done consecutively after Eid and when coupled with Ramadan are equivalent to reward of fast thing in one year. You can do them separately. But saying best to do them consecutively. Fasting Muharram, uh, both the ninth, especially the 10th, which is an expi expiation for the year. 
right? So uh, fasting the in Muharram, the both the ninth and the tenth, especially the tenth. So the ninth and the tenth, and the and then the ten days of Zulhijjah, especially the day of Arafah, which is the ninth, right? Which is a forgiveness of the one year past and one year future, two years forgiveness. So these are the following dislikes singular for fasting: Rajab, Juma, Friday, Saturday. The day of doubt, that is the 30th of Shaban, if there is no justification when it is time for the signing. Right? Um, fasting, Nairuz, Maharajan, every other holiday of the disbelievers, these are Persian holidays. Um, any day singled out for veneration and preceding Ramadan by one or two days, uh, unless any of the above coincide with a habitual fast. Right? Um, yeah. So these are the days we should not uh, fast upon. Like we can't make our own holidays, like or holy days. Um, just make random days and um, uh, for ibadat and so forth. Um, you can do nafil ibadah anytime, but then you, if you if you're specifying it and saying that it should be done on this day, then this is problematic because there's if there's no basis for it. It's just a general nafal, right? Um, this is how bid'at start, where people fixate on something and make it more than what it is, and there's nothing really substantive from the sunnah to establish that this should be done in this way. Fasting days of tashriq, sacrifice of uh, muta or qiran is not valid. Um, unless done, so for the ritual. So if the person, so the days of tashriq are the last... Um, uh, 12, 13, 14th of the, sorry, 11, 12, 13th of the, uh, of the, of the Hajj, of uh, Zul Hijjah. Um, and so people that are doing muta meaning uh, Hajj al and which is in the Quran, so they have a sacrifice, right? If they're able to do that, then in this place, they fast in the days of Hajj. Um, so they, they're given this exemption to fast uh, there. Uh, because of the inability to do the sacrifice. Um, there is absolutely no fasting on Eid, which is impermissible. Whoever begins a voluntary deed besides Hajj or Umrah is recommended to complete it, but not obliged. It is, if it is not fulfilled, it does not have to be made. It is a categorical obligatory to complete a compulsory act, even if its time is extensive. For example, prayer, make, prayer making of Ramadan, an oath, an expiation. If it is invalid, there is nothing extra to be done, nor is there any expiation. So the question. Yeah, I mean, that doesn't matter. So, so the brother is saying half of Ramadan, he is actually in uh, Nowruz, um, uh, which is a Persian holiday. And in the Persian world, it's celebrated till now. Um, more like a historical Persian calendar holiday, if I remember correctly. Something to do with the... Um, uh, the calendar, uh, but um, the point is that uh, if it coincidentally occurs, it's fine. It doesn't make a difference. But if you go out of your way to make a fast for no rules specifically, which doesn't have any base in Sharia, then this is a bid'ah and this is introducing some of the not from it, and hence it's dislike um, to single it out is impermissible actually to uh, do such a thing which is not from the deen. Um, So whoever starts a fast, a voluntary fast, a deed, besides Hajj and Umrah, which you have to complete, right? Um, so if you start in Nafil Ibadah, it's, it's good, it's recommended to complete it, but if you didn't complete it, um, you're not, it's not fardal on you to complete it. There are other Imams, like in the Hanafi school, yeah, it's, it, they have to complete it. Um, and if it is nullified, it does not have to be made up. There's no qada for it. So in the Hanbali fiqh, if you started the Nafil fast and you break in the middle, although it's Make sure it's better you complete it, but let's say you got tired or whatever reason you didn't, you couldn't complete the fast. Um, you don't have to do a qada for that. I think in the Hanafi mother, if you um start a nafil fast, if you break the fast, now you have to do make up do a qada of that later on. You have to now you're obliged, it's wajib on it. was nafil when he started, it became wajib if you left it in the middle. Allah alam.
um, but in the Hanbali Muslim, no such thing. Is uh, nafil stays in nafil, it doesn't become wajib. It is the category obligatory to uh, complete a compulsory act, even if it is at the time and extent. So, but but a farad act has to be completed, right? Um, yeah, and if it's invalidated, there's nothing extra, right? Um, I'll read that again. It is a category obligatory to complete a compulsory act, even if it is at the time is extensive. For example, prayer, salat, making up Ramadan, an oath, an expiation, all of these have to be made, uh, these have to be completed. If it is invalidated, there is nothing extra to be done, nor is any expiation. The best day is Friday and the best night is Layl al Qadr, right? Sought in the last 10 days of Ramadan, particularly in the last odd nights, of which the most hopeful is at seventh, meaning the 27th. Abundant supplication should be done in the prayer, O oh Allah, indeed you are the oft forgiving in the uh, of uh, pardoning who loves to pardon, so pardon me. And similarly also, like we're coming up to Nisfa Shaban, the 15th of Shaban. 15th Shaban, you know, Ibn um, Rajab al-Hambali, my khutbah was on it actually. Um, I mean, there's a lot of discussion, but there's nothing of the, if you put all the riwayat together, there is a significance at night. Sheikh Fazlur Rahman Azami from South Africa is originally from India. He wrote a book on this and a booklet on this. And other ulama, many ulama have written. He said, if you put all the riwayat, they're all weak, but if you put them all together, it tells you they corroborate a significance of the night. So you can argue then by extension, the day is extension of the night and therefore the significance of the day, but there's more significant of the night. Um, you cannot say with, with um, certainty that the day has significance uh, to fast the day of the 15th. Um, but um, 13th, 14th, 15th are from the Ayam al as we read before as well. So, I mean, there, there is a, so it's not totally without significance. Um, however, to have gatherings for it or have programs for it and, you know, to have like massive, there's no such thing established in the Sunnah, right? You don't see, senior sahaba or narrating su such things uh, in any um so duas made in salat in sajda um the, well, the best duas are from the sunnah and quran as long as the duas are not uh brothers asking i don't know what it's related to what we're reading at the moment but anyway um don't, uh, if you don't mind don't ask random things that we've I think we might have discussed this before because it just throws me off a little bit. But um, the du'as, they shouldn't be, what generally, the one of the rules is mentioned, of course, the best du'as are from the Quran and Sunnah. Um, but it mentioned that you should not make du'a, we went through this actually, du'as of um, desires or worldly, worldly nature should not be asked. You know, Ya Allah, feed me a kebab. I mean, in the fifth books, it generally mentioned, Ya Allah, feed me an apple, right? Um, but like maybe a modern version is Ya Allah, feed me. As an example, a simple example, um, Wallahu alam. I mean, it's a, a... All right, where were we? We're talking about fasting. <laughs> You're in sajda. Um, yeah, tikaf. That's what we're up to. Yeah, so what does Iatikaf mean? It means to stick to something, uh, to be particular about something, to stick to something. And um, in, in the Sharia, it means to, to uh, the one of the translations is spiritual retreat, the, the modern translation, some ulama have written like that. But basically, to, to be particular, Iatikaf is Iatikaf. It's strict to the masjid for ibadah. So itikaf is recommended all the time, especially in Ramadan, in which the last 10 are the most emphasized. It becomes obligatory due to a vow. Its prerequisites include the following. Intention, Islam, sanity, discernment, and the absence of what necessitates ghusl. Additionally, must be in a masjid that established congregational prayer for those required to attend. So you can't do it in musallas, right? Masjids are buildings that are permanently dedicated as a house of Allah. Right. Sometimes in universities we have musallas, right, uh, or universities or other places, or someone puts a little musalla in a factory. This is not a masjid because a factory can be sold; it can be turned into other things. 
this has happened repeatedly. So masjid is something you can't, you can't, uh, under normal circumstances, very extreme rare cases, but it's permanently till the day of judgment is the masjid, put it that way. So additionally, must be in a masjid that establishes a congregational prayer for those required to attend. The masjid includes its expansion, its uh, roof, its fence courtyard, and its minaret, which either it or its door is within. Whoever vows to make itikaf or perform prayer in the masjid, other than the three, is permitted to do so in a different one. If they vow to make it in the one uh, one of them, they're permitted to do so uh, uh, in it or in a more virtuous one. There you go. Like you're not restricted to one masjid. So whoever vows to make itikaf or perform prayer in a masjid, other than the three, three meaning the masjid, hara masjid, nabui masjid, is permitted to do so in a different one. If they vow to make it in one of them, they're permitted to do so in a one uh, or in a more virtuous one. The best is Masjid al-Haram, then the Prophet's Masjid, then al-Aqsa. Whoever makes continual itikaf due to a vow is not to leave except out of necessity. They are not to visit the sick nor attend a funeral unless stipulated. Like if he makes an intention before that I'm making itikaf for the next 10 days in Ramadan, last 10 days, and I vow that I'll stay and, you know, like um, unless such, if there's a janaza, like I have to attend the janazah, then he can make that exemption in his intention. Uh, it is invalidated by the following, leaving the masjid without excuse, intending to leave, even if they do not, intercourse, ejaculation due to intimate acts, apostasy, and intoxication. Um, where were we? When, whenever, wherever it is, uh, whenever, sorry, wherever it is invalidated, the continual non-time specific type must be recommended with, uh, recommend, recommend, sorry, recommenced without expiation. So whenever it, it, the cup is invalidated, uh, the continual non-time specific type must be, so this is talking about the, uh, must be rec recommenced without expiation. That which is time specified must be recommenced with an obligatory expiation for breaking an oath due to the loss of setting. Uh, setting. It is not invalidated for leaving the masjid to use the restroom, bring food, attend the Jummah, which is uh, required. Like you have to go to another masjid to pray Jummah. Maybe in your masjid there's no Jummah, right? Or perform some obligatory purification, etc. It is recommended to busy with righteous deeds and refrain from what is of no concern. La yani. Right, layani uh, 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 things that will distract you from the um, uh, from the tikaf because you're there. And this is generally, I in masjid where I, Imam, I give a little talk. I go through the masail with the brothers, and I also explain to them learn how to switch their phones off. I think this is uh, the modern day distraction. Like people are sitting there, brothers sitting with their laptop, mobile phone. They've got all the um, they're connected to the whole world. They're watching the news. They're sitting watching videos while they're in itikaf in the masjid. So I'm not saying this is not, this is pointless, but this is not itikaf. Itikaf is, uh, the, the, this goes against the whole nature of itikaf, which is to isolate yourself from the whole world. Your job place, your home, all the other places that you connect, your outside people, you're only there in the house of Allah, dedicating yourself for that time, for that short amount of time, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So um, when going to the masjid, itikaf should be intended for the duration that they remain there. So even if you're going every day to the masjid, you just make it intention, the Allah I make um near to itikaf, like for the time that I'm there, for the for the time that I'm uh, in the um uh, in the masjid. So it could be like an hour or two hours, right? <clears throat> we start Hajj. I think that's the uh, we only have one session like next week, inshallah. Um I sort of miscalculated. I thought I had another two weeks, but actually we have one, only one last session next week. Um, before we start the Masail here, I wanted to show you something. One second. Can you guys see this diagram? Okay, good. This is a simple depiction. It's based on Hanafi fiqh. When I teach the Hajji, a majority of the Hajjis that go in Australia, they're Hanafi. There's not a lot of differences in Hajj um, in the sense of because it's really based on the one Hajj of Rasulullah that is 
the Hajat al Wida, the farewell Hajj, and that's documented in detail. This is a simple depiction of the actions of uh, Umrah. And then there's a separate page, this one here for Hajj. So this is from, if you go to islamicposters.co.uk, you can see this. And, you know, you can fit in that information according to the Madhab. It's a very just procedural step way of like just looking at the whole Umrah. Um, if you've never been Umrah, no matter how much theory um, you study, you sort of get, it's overwhelming. So this simplifies everything. I created like as a 1A3 poster, pocket size. We give it to hajis and people going for Umrah. And then they use that to do their Umrah. They can do the whole thing based on this. It's very procedural and step-by-step. Step. It starts off, I'm not going to go through the Ula Hakam, but I just wanted to show you. So if you go to islamicposter.co.uk, you'll find this there, inshallah. So if you look here, because this is going to extend the class time too long, but basically, Umrah is four actions. Ihram, right? Tawaf, seven times around the Kaab and all its details. Sa'i, going between Safa and Marwa and shaving the hair, right? It's one of the best depictions in the one pager that I've seen that covers actually the whole of, uh, uh, the, whole of the, the Umrah acts in just a very simple. There are others as well, but this is the one I've used for like 10 years for Hajj groups and Umrah and for programs and so forth. They just... This is really, um, really simple and um, nice. So it starts off with doing like the Jummah Sunnahs of removing the hair, nails, do a full ghusl, at least the wudu, before the miqat to pray two rakat. Um, now, in our mother specifically, there is no um, rakat to be prayed for the haram, but if you pray any sunnah or any nafal, um, they. Uh, like it follows a salat, for example, farad salat. If you pray farad salat, you can make the intention after that. And you make the intention and then make the talbiyah. Then you, when you travel to Makkah, you might be flying in before the miqat boundary, which we'll go through in a second. You enter the masjid haram. Then he talks about the safa. You go up to the hajj aswad corner, go seven times around, pray two rakat behind maqam Ibrahim in the, in the side of maqam Ibrahim of the Kaaba. And then you go to Safa, Marwa, Safa, Marwa, Safa, Marwa, Safa, Marwa, end with Marwa. So here you do seven times. Between Safa, Marwa, seven times doesn't mean back and forth. Number one is Safa to Marwa. And then from Marwa to Safa, back again is two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's it, right? And then you go get your hair cut, right? And so that's in just in briefly, like uh, this chart, you can download it, go there, islamicposter.co.uk. Um, and it's nice, like they summarize everything. Yes, it's according to the Hanafi fiqh, but it's, it's very little, very little differences you'll find. Um, maybe the du'a is a little bit different, but there's very little, you can go through each thing yourself. But if you want just a one page, a one um, simple depiction. And then the next, uh, in our madhab, in the Hanbali madhab, Tamatta is better, and 99% of the hajis are going to do tamatta according. It's the best one according, according to the Hanafis, Quran is best, where you do one intention, uh, you make a niyat for um, uh, Umrah and in one ihram. So you do the Umrah, and then you sit in, you wait in ihram until the hajj days, then you, the same ihram, you don't go out of ihram. In the, the Shafi'i say, the one ihram, um, they do, they're in one ihram for hajj, ifrad, they prefer that. So you're still waiting. The humbly ones, the easiest one, everybody does it. 99% of Hanafis, Shafi'is, they all do, do the, and the humbly one is to do tamatta, which is to do um, Umrah, get out of Ihram, cut the hair, wait for the days of Hajj, it could be three days, four days, two days, whatever it is. And on the eighth of the Hijjah, the eighth of the, the first day of Hajj, then you do another Ihram for a Hajj. It's the most easiest one. And according to Alma, that is the best one. Um, so then there's a, this chart here, you can also download from the same website, a simple way of depicting the whole of Hajj. So you've got the one, two, three, four, five, six days. The last day is optional. It repeats the same thing as the 12th. Then what you do, where you are, the flags represent where you are in each day and the actions that you need to do. Like day one, the eighth of the Hijjah, right? You don't, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing to do except for Ihram. Same as, and you make intention, talbiyah, and you basically go with mina, 
you pray your salats there and you spend the night in Mina. The next day is the ninth of Zil Hijjah. In the morning, um, you pray Fajr and so forth. You go to Arafah from Mina and Arafah, you spend the whole day making dua. At Maghrib time, then you go to Muzdalifah, spend the night there. And then the next day, you got a lot of actions to do. So here it's sort of more about being in the place and that fulfills obligation. In that place, you should make dua. In Muzdalifah in the night, you should rest and you join the prayers as well. That will come uh, later on in more detailed books. Um, on the 10th, then you sp sp uh, stone the big jamarat. You walk past the first two, the last one that is closest in the direction of the Kaaba. You do the stone that, you skip the first two. And then um, you do the other here as well, your animal sacrifice, and you trim your hair as well. And then if you can do the tawaf and sa'i, right, the tawaf of ziyara for hajj, you do it on this day, or you can do the 11th or the 12th. The next day, 11th and 12th, you do um, uh, go stone all three, come back. Three jamarat, come back. And the 13th is optional, do all three and then come back. Is that clear? Like, I mean, I'm, I know I'm rushing through it a little bit, but it's a simple depiction of the main actions of uh, Hajj. You can read it through yourself, um, but it's very procedural, very easy. Uh, and this is how I advise people do it. Rasulullah was teaching the Hajj on the go. You know, take from me your rights of Hajj, right? The uh, rituals of Hajj. So Rasulullah was doing it, Sahaba were learning on the go. So you don't have to become a Mufti of Hajj before you go for Hajj. You should learn, check, and make sure you know. And hopefully have a good alim with you. Um, the system is a bit all over the place in the last two years, but um, have someone in contact and now through WhatsApp or messaging services and Telegram, whatnot, um, to make sure that you do your actions all correctly. But if you keep it, okay, that's all I have to worry about today. This is what I have to worry about today, this day. I've done this already. Now I'm to the next day. If you do it like that, and in that, fill it with Quran, Tilawa, Zikr, Dua, you know, like, and connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and along with doing these actions. Then, uh, inshallah, you know, anyway, I do so many Hajj talks that the, these classes become Hajj lecture. Um, so I've got to get back to the. Uh, I could share the, uh, if you want, do you want me to share the, uh, those images? I'm not sure how I would do it. There you go. So, yeah. Okay, I've shared. Can you see them in the side in the chat box? The two posters. Okay, I just send them now. Just let me know if you've received them. We oh, yeah. have. All right. I always remind the people, like the Sahaba the line of the man came to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, teach me the Hajj that I will know. Um, um, teach me the Hajj that I'll be like the day my mother gave birth to me. So he didn't know the how, but he knew the value of it, what Hajj was, and what a, he knew the rewards, right? And so therefore, from that we understand that, that he had the knowledge of the rewards of what a good Hajj is. Um, and then the Rasulullah Sallam taught him that, right? That so he, it's it's shows you that like that he didn't know the procedure in detail, right? I'm not sure what's happening. Um, uh, so yeah, so he knew the he knew the um, procedure uh, more than uh, he. Sorry, he didn't know the procedure, but he knew the rewards, the benefits of it. So you need to know both, obviously. Uh, but um, uh, you can see where the priorities uh, priorities were. I don't know about that question about the Rami. I don't know. I'll have to have a look, inshallah. If it is a communal obligation every year, 
meaning it's Hajj has to be done every year, not by everybody, but some people have to do it. Alhamdulillah is never stopped, right? Even during COVID, a small number, a few thousand that did it in 2019 or 2021, 20, um, during the COVID, the first year and second year, still Hajj got done. It's not that no, no Hajj was done, Hajj was not stopped. As long as some people do it, then the obligation is lifted, the sin is lifted of the Ummah. It is to go to Makkah to perform specific acts at specific times and in, in, in his appeal of Islam. Umrah is to visit the house in a specific manner, both obligatory once in a lifetime, based on the five prerequisites, which include Islam, sanity. It is not valid from a disbeliever or the insane, even if the guardian were to make it haram on their behalf. Puberty and complete freedom. It is valid from, uh, for a minor or a slave. Uh, it is valid for a minor or a slave. The minor's guardian is to make it haram on their behalf. It will not suffice either of them for the obligatory hajj or umrah. The fard hajj is not fulfilled. The, the guardian gets a reward for making them do it, but the fard they still have to do when they have the ability. If a minor reaches puberty or a slave is manumitted before the standing wukuf at Arafah or after it and they return within enough time, it will suffice their obligatory hajj. Right, they became Bali right there and they, um, right, before the standing or after it, and they return with enough time. Like they become Bali and then they, before Maghrib or um, before they actually come and they spend a few minutes, right, then they hajj, they've done their, they've done their fard hajj. Um, question. What's the, um, does anybody know, what's the um, Hajj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he invites, he calls us for Hajj. Um, he orders us to do complete Hajj and Umrah um, so that you may come, for that they come and witness, make mushahada of its benefits. But he leaves the benefits, Mufti Rafi Osmani, rahmatullah he passed away recently, a few months ago. As what a book of his he was saying, but Allah doesn't mention what the benefits are. Uh, this is Mufti Taqir Usmani's older brother. Um, he he said that in his one of his books that um, regarding Hajj, I think Hajj life after Hajj, that uh, if a person does, um, if a person uh, goes for Hajj and he's supposed to witness the benefits, but the benefits are not specified. What are the specific benefits? What are the benefits? It's left open-ended. It's between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What you would behold and understand and see is specific to you. No hajj operator, I mean, I, I deal with, dealt with a lot of hajj operators. They can guarantee for you your experience, right? And choose a good one if you're going to go and try your best. But at the end of the day, you're coming on his invitation in a specific manner that he wants to come at a specific time. Umrah is all year round, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Shawuliullah rahmatullah in his book, um, if I remember correctly, he said that Umrah is only the expression of shukr for Islam, for deen, for being Muslim, for Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam, Sayyidina Hajar alayhi salam, what that family did there. It's an expression of gratefulness, something that is um, prescribed all the time is there for shukr, as an expression of shukr. Allah alam. Um, Imam Hassan Basri said that someone who goes for hajj, um, the life after hajj, they should turn away from the dunya uh, to the akhirah. They become akhirah centric in their approach to everything. The sign that his hajj has been good, right? Uh, the fifth is capability, owning provisions and suitable transport. I think I'm looking at the wrong slide. That's why. So, for example, provisions mean generally food and suitable transport, right? Or possession of what is enough to obtain it, as, so long as it is not addition to what is required of books, dwellings, servants and both personal and family expenses necessary for survival. So those things that you need to live or your family needs to live, that's excluded. Like this is talking about, firstly talks about what you need to get there 
or the money that you need to get there. In our case, for example, do you have enough money for the ticket? Do you have enough money for the hotel? These are normal things that you need to do now without you can't do your hajj. As long as in addition to what is required of books, Ajajib, the books keeps on coming again and again as a necessity. Like if you need money for books, like you have, you have some money set aside that you can buy books with, then that cannot go to the, that cannot be counted towards a hajman. We exclude it. Whoever meets these prerequisites is immediately required to go so long as the way is safe. If they're unable to go due to old age uh, or chronic illness, a free proxy, even if female must perform hajj, what we call hajj badal, they go on their naib, they niabat, then they go on behalf of the person, must perform both on their behalf if they are obligations. If it is not valid for someone who has not completed hajj to perform the obligatory vow of voluntary hajj on behalf of another, they would have to fulfill their own hajj first. If they do so, it will be counted as their own obligatory hajj, right? There is an additional sixth prerequisite for females. They must find a husband or a mahram of legal capacity who can afford to both their provisions and transport. If they're not able, they are to appoint a proxy uh, on their behalf. If they make Hajj without a mahram, it is considered valid, though haram, it's impermissible. In the Hanbali Mazhab, Umrah and Hajj are wajib for men and women, but for the woman, the condition is that she has to have a mahram, even for Umrah, even for Hajj. In the Fiqh Shafi'i, they have a leeway if she travels in a group of women in safety, but this is only valid for the one. Umrah, because in, in our mazhabs, in Shafi'i and the Hamadi mazhab, both Hajj and Umrah are wajib, right? Not just Hajj. In the Hanafi mazhab, only Hajj is wajib, Umrah is Sunnah. But in our mazhabs, it's both Hajj and Umrah are wajib. But the Shafi'i is allowed for the Fard Hajj and Umrah, right? That she can travel without her mahram as long as she's in a group of women who's um, their safety, right? A trustworthy women. The problem is like, this might have been okay. I'm talking about Australia and the Western countries, but the new system that they've introduced, like someone called me last week and I was listening to one brother who does programs for Hajj and he went, he saw the system last year and it was all over the place, unfortunately, where men were ending up in women's rooms and it was a, it was a mess um, where there were like two brothers staying, two sisters, they don't know each other, but they have these joint, you know, share rooms and so forth. It was a disaster. So depending on where you're going from, um, but in the humble, as for the madhab, for a woman to travel by herself, doesn't matter what her age is, uh, it is haram for her. Um, it is haram for her to travel without a mahram. She's, a, she's not obliged to perform the hajj if she cannot get a mahram, right? The miqats, the miqats are sp specified place and times for specific acts of worship. The Miqat for Medina Zul Hulayfa, for the Levant, for Sham, it's in Egypt and is the West, is Juhfa, for Yemen is Yalamlam, for the highlands of the Hijaz, the highlands of Yemen and Ta'if is Qarn, and for the East, Idhat Irq. They are for their respective inhabitants and all who pass by. Obviously, in the old days, when you go into Mecca, you would have to go by road. So, de depending on where you are in the world, you're coming through a specific direction. These Miqat is the boundary. You must have your Ihram on before you enter that boundary. Right? So you have the ihram, you've done your niyyat. Just to remember, the ihram is not the two sheets. The ihram is the state that you come into after making niyyat and talbiya. Right? So a lady, she doesn't have any specific clothing. As long as she doesn't have any cloth touching her face, right? That's the only thing. But she doesn't have specific footwear. The men have specific footwear. They have two sheets. They cannot wear anything underneath it. They cannot wear garments, stitched garments like a shirt or pants and so forth. Uh, but that's not the haram because you can wear them anytime. So you cannot say a person is in haram because they've got two sheets on, right? Ihram is that which is a state that you come in, in which certain things that are halal, they're restricted to you now, the haram. So for example, perfume is restricted for male and female. So they're both in ihram, right? The man can't cover his head. Of course, the lady's wearing a hijab. She's covering her head. So th therefore that it's not to do with. So for the man, part of his ihram is to cover, to uncover the head. But for the lady, of course, she's wearing a hijab. That doesn't apply to her. Um, <clears throat> the 
the now you're just flying in so you're flying in let's say we're flying from the east we're flying into jeddah so especially for us for, we're coming from the east like southeast asia malaysia all these countries we're coming from the east right so we're making ihram generally in the last port or some will make it be like half an hour before the plane lands in jeddah um if we're going directly to makka first if we do not umrah first then going to medina then we'll be um uh you know half an hour before the plane lands in jeddah because you cross you cross over the miqat you cross over the miqat then you have to come back driving a bus or whatever you come back into makka so because you're crossing over it that before you reach the miqat as a plane flying over and go past and a part of jeddah is not in the miqat as far as i remember then you're coming back again through the miqat a boundary so um in this case you are not uh, you have to do it in the aeroplane or the last port like Qatar Abu Dhabi Dubai whichever airport that you're coming from usually we're coming through in Australia we generally go through Abu uh, Abu Dhabi and um so then we'll make the intention there um in the thing or you can make it on the airplane right the turakat or praying salat is not compulsory part of the uh, niyat of ihram um If you're going from Medina Munawwara obviously you make it you get everything and Zul Halaif is a border just outside the outskirts of Medina Munawwara you make intention on this one a question Yeah though that's coming up that question where perfume is coming up So um the miqat of whoever is dwelling is closer than uh let me just read that carefully there there are, there are as about the miqat of whoever's dwelling is closer than them is they is they dwelling sometimes uh, the english uh, confuses me i look at the arabic the arabic makes more sense than the english sometimes astaghfirullah <laughs> um Okay. So if the if they if they're dwelling this uh, English needs a lot of work. I just realized I think last two weeks um so these are for their respect uh, and the miqat of whoever is dwelling is closer than the miqat. All right? Is they dwelling it's well. So somebody lives within the boundary of the miqat, then it's the uh the house itself is that's where they start their ihram from whoever is in makkah is to make ihram for hajj there it is valid from outside sacred grounds without a blood sacrifice um it is valid from outside sac- sacred grounds i think what we're talking about is the haram so and then um i'll just finish reading it's valid from outside sacred uh, i mean a lot of this doesn't apply to us because we don't live there or near there ihram for umrah is made from outside sacred grounds sacred hand means a haram um they have to translate everything you know like i hate over translations it is valid from makkah but it requires a blood sacrifice blood sacrifice is dumb you sacrifice um an animal so how many borders for makkah are there there are three borders uh one is the mawaqit the miqat we just explained this outer boundary then there's um uh makkah and then there's haram which used to be bigger than makkah but now it's sort of like makkah's actually gone past it like actually gone past what we call the boundary of the haram um you must be in ihram at if you're at, coming from outside of the miqat the outer boundary like we are um unless someone here is from makka <laughs> then um whoever is inside inside from uh, inside is from their home um the house of makka is irrelevant doesn't make if someone is inside the haram not makka inside the haram they need to go to outside what's called the hill the inner there's another inner boundary like tanaim jarana um arafa right these areas like you can go um uh to those areas so if you're in um the haram then you need to go to outside to the hill which is the inner the boundary of the 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 boundary of the haram all right let's continue the ihram types it is recommended for everyone we should to make ihram that is the intention for the rites to perform ghusl at tayammum to cleanse themselves to perfume their body 
which is disliked on the clothing? I hope that answered the question the brother's asking. And for men to wear two clean white coverings, one up and one lower, after removing all fitted clothing. Ihram is made after compulsory uh, uh, salat or two rakat voluntary prayer outside of the prohibited times. Its intention is a prerequisite. Its intention is a prerequisite. The best type of is tamattu, that is to make ihram for umrah during the months of hajj, meaning after Ramadan. Uh, the months of hajj are um, shawal, uh, Zulqada, Zulhijjah. So Ramadan finishes, the months of Hajj start, that two, two months and a bit. And then after its completion to make Ihram for Hajj, Ifrad is to make Ihram for Hajj, and then after its completion is to make Ihram for Umrah. Quran is to make Ihram for both together and to make Ihram for Umrah, and then add it before beginning of Tawaf. Yeah, you can. You can enter haram again to do another umrah. Yes, you can. That's what you're supposed to do. If you're going to do a second umrah, you're supposed to go out. It is recommended to specify a ritual type and to make it conditional, saying, oh, I desire um, such and such a ritual, so facilitate it for me and accept it from me. If I were to be prevented by something, then my place be of disengagement is whenever I'm prevented. If it is made, it is not voided and thus must be completed and made up. So here we go. This is talking about in your intention, you make exemptions, right? Like if I was stopped for this reason, so Allah desired such and such a ritual, so I'm making Umrah, so they facilitate it for me and accept it from me. And if I were to be prevented by something, then my place of disengagement is where I am prevented. If it is made, if it is, made it is not voided. And thus must be completed and made up. One second. Yeah, so when the intention is made, then that intention is um, uh, like, uh, like, yeah, now you have to complete it. Right? Like, once intention is made, like, Despite that, if that thing doesn't happen, you are locked in still. That's the point. Do you understand? Like, let's say, Ya Allah, if a dangerous animal comes on the way or something like that, then, you know, like you, you're giving an exemption to yourself. But no dangerous animal comes. Now it's like you have to complete it. And if you don't do it, you have to do the qada of it. Right? These are mahzurat of ihram. There are nine prohibitions in ihram, which are removing hair, clipping uh, finger uh, or toner, Sorry, almost finished. Or toenails covering the head of a male, a male wearing fitted clothing except for pants in the absence of a waist strap and hoofs in the absence of sandals. Applying perfume, killing a consumable land game animal um, and what it begets um, and what is begotten from crossbreeding, entering a marriage contract, intercourse and other intimate acts. For all the prohibitions, there is expiations except for killing lice and entering a marriage contract. The local value for eggs and locusts must be paid. The expiation of a single hair and nail is feeding a poor person, and that of two is two, feeding two people. Necess necessity knows no law for the muhrim. However, they must offer an expiation. Right. Um, so... Yeah, so a person, um, there's different levels of um, the prohibitions of ihram. Uh, for example, nikah is the most thing. There's no fidya. It makes the act fasid and the person is sinful. Um, killing lice is the most lightest one. Um, uh, fidya of uh, ada um, and other things that are coming later on, inshallah. Next week we'll finalize, finish off with that. Um, and fidya, this penalty, like you have to pay for jima intercourse, and that's mughallah, that's safiya. We'll talk about that next week, inshallah. Um, the main ones to remember that people very, like, generally, alhamdulillah, we have clothing, we have um, many of the things like hunting, we don't have to worry about these things, lice and things. I don't think many of us have to worry about, or eggs of wild birds or locusts. I don't think we hunt. These are not, these are things that we don't have to worry. The main we are worried the thing you worry about is removing hair, clipping nails, covering the you know thing. Make sure we don't wear any clothes, 
Generally, we have footwear available, so we don't have to wear hoofs. Uh, we have ihrams easily available. Perfume is an issue. That's a big issue because perfume is in everything, um, like um, shampoos and so forth. So we have to be very cautious about type of soap and things that we use. Um, so there's like, one second. Yeah, hair that falls out is excused. That's fine. In the normal process of things, this is about plucking hairs or if you're using extra effort to remove hairs. Yeah, in the, in the normal duration of wudu and so forth, hair falling out, these, you lose about 100 hairs a day. I think some of us, the ones that are, that's are balding, probably lose more. But uh, on a net, we have a net. You grow 100 hairs, you lose 100 hairs. So those must be balding. They must be losing more hairs than they're gaining. So if they're losing hairs, then that's a normal thing. A daily, you lose 100 hairs or something like that. So you, you're, you're always dropping hairs, I guess. So I think... Um, the, the, the hairs that fall off as a normal part of just you're doing wudu, you're not plucking it or grabbing and pulling it, is a different st story to um, so those excuses, inshallah. Any questions? Sorry if I sound a bit flat, I apologize. It's been a long day uh, coming from another class, and tomorrow we've got a big day. Make dua for us. We have a Khatam al Bukhari for students that are here at the moment, they've come. Um, they're getting their lesson ready for tomorrow, last lesson. They've been studying for more than a decade, mashallah. So, uh, alhamdulillah, I'll accept. One's a pediatrician, he's a doctor. The other one's already an imam of a masjid, mashallah. Um, and uh, alhamdulillah, they've been studying. So, they tomorrow all our satis, our ulama, they're coming gathering and so make dua for acceptance. And uh, Allah bless them and take work from them, inshallah. They benefit the ummah. Inshallah. I mean, any questions? Any other questions? I'll just check if I missed any questions.